Thanks to everybody for joining and participating in the UCF College of Arts and Humanities Speaker Series. We hope that the seminars provide information and entertainment regarding our teaching research and creative work in the college and to pique your interest and increase your participation. You should invite your friends to come to the seminars and engage in the aha moments that the seminars are intended to elicit. Today we have Dr. Connie Lester from the Department of History and Riches, and Riches stands for Regional Initiative for Collecting History, Experiences, and Stories, and CHDR, some people call it cheddar like cheese, but it's the Center for Humanities and Digital Research. And next week we have Professor Stella Sung and the staff from the Center for Research in Education and Arts, Technology, and Entertainment, or UCF CREATE for short, who will be discussing community work they're doing from UCF downtown. So don't forget about that. That's next Thursday. Today's talk via Zoom, like the others, will be around 35 to 45 minutes, give or take a few, with opportunity for questions from the audience. Notice the Zoom controls at the bottom of your screen. One of them is the chat function, where if you have any questions about today's topic for Dr. Lester, you can type them there in the chat box and the moderator, most likely me, will keep track of and ask questions for you for Dr. Lester. Our moderators, and there's more than one of us, will help to keep the seminar on track. And remember, they will also, because they're very helpful moderators, remove disruptors, also known as boom, Zoom bombers, from the program so you don't have to worry about that. We're planning and hoping for a very lively and interesting discussion. Remember too that today's presentation will be posted on the, on the College of Arts and Humanities YouTube account and shared at cah.ucf.edu forward slash seminars. We're happy that you've joined us today. And so I'll now turn it over to Dr. Connie Lester from the Department of History. Good afternoon. Um, before we begin today, I would like to thank the College of Arts and Humanities for creating and supporting the seminar series. My colleagues in the Department of History and the Center for Humanities and Digital Research for years of collaboration and support that has made Riches and the Bending Toward Justice Project possible, and you, the audience, for joining us today. The project I will describe today has many moving parts. So I'm offering an online, uh, an outline of the project for you um, to be able to see where we're going and perhaps to keep myself on track. Um, and on task, okay? So Bending Toward Justice is a multi-year digital exhibit project created by the core team of the Regional Initiative for Collecting Histories, Experiences, and Stories, better known by its acronym, RICHES, in collaboration with the programmers and designers in the Center for Humanities and Digital Research. As you can see, um, the core team is made up, uh, is quite large, um, but each member brings to the group their own special skill set. So I'm directing the project, Dr. Fawn Gordon uh, in history is the coordinator of Africana Studies. Um, Dr. Amy Giroux is the associate director of, uh, of Cheddar. Uh, Mike Shire is a production coordinator and research specialist in Cheddar. Mike Lundblade is the for the Department of History and Riches. And Jeff Cravero is our metadata editor. Connie Harper is a software developer in Cheddar, but interestingly enough, she was the first programmer for Riches. Um, so she comes at it from two directions, really. Tiffany Rivera is the coordinator, program coordinator in um, the Department of History, and she does the community outreach for us for this project. And Kayla Campagna is an administrative assistant in the Department of History, and she's been keeping our bibliography up to date. We've had three interns. Uh, Sophie Barrett was an undergraduate uh, intern with us as the project first got underway. And we currently have Anna Kephart and Sabrina Sawney, who are graduate student interns at the time. Well, this project is much more complicated and much and has a deeper design than just the core team. So I'll give you some information about that as well. 
For the past three years, students in courses as varied as economic history, Africana studies, and digital storytelling have been data, mapping Black entrepreneurship, conducting oral histories, and creating um, video stories that will become part of the exhibits. The projects have spread outside UCF, and this past year, students at Rollins College, under the direction of Professor Claire Strom, completed the mapping of home ownership and rental tenants in the Hannibal Square community. Their work will be part of the Black Capital exhibit. We anticipate that other classes at UCF and perhaps at surrounding schools will also contribute to this project as it goes on. The project builds on existing partnerships between riches and local museums, university archives, and activist organizations to develop the, these exhibits. Some examples include the Wells Built Museum, the Alliance for Truth and Justice, Valencia College's Peace and Justice Institute, and the archives at Bethune-Cookman University, Tuskegee University, the University of Florida, and the Florida State Archives, in addition to special collections at UCF. The project continues to benefit from the personal collections and oral histories of individuals who allow us to digitize their family photographs and letters and who tell us the family stories that are not documented with physical artifacts. The project also collaborates with another Riches project, uh, a Riches partner, the Florida Prison Education Project, whose efforts to understand the history of incarceration in minority communities and bring education to Florida jails and prisons is an important part, part of UCF outreach. Finally, the project works with the Public History Internship Program to bring undergraduate and graduate interns into the project team to allow them to gain public history experience. We have an advisory board that includes community historians and academic historians who lend their expertise to the project and are available to review the technological issues, the design of the exhibits, and the scholarship that In addition, we can draw uh, on the expertise of the, of the Riches Advisory Board and the Advisory Board of the Florida Historical Court. This is a complicated organizational structure, but it allows us to carry on what is a multi-year interactive, very complex uh, project. All of this works with our, our statement, our digital statement um, about the project itself. And it's based on a quote. The arc of history is long, but it bends toward justice. Those were words spoken by Theodore Parker, an abolitionist minister in 1853. Martin Luther King Jr. modified the quote during the civil rights movement when he proclaimed, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. The quote is either, in either form can be interpreted to mean that a passive wait for justice will be rewarded. It can also imply that justice is conferred by those of superior moral, political, or social status on those less fortunate. The Bending Toward Justice Digital Project builds on a different interpretation. The exhibits planned and presented in this digital space document the ways in which African Americans bent the arc in their everyday lives and under extraordinary conditions. And that meant that sustaining family life, building schools and churches, organizing fraternal associations and charities, accumulating wealth through physical labor and entrepreneurship, and participating in civic, social, and political life chipped away at the injustices perpetuated by racism, segregation, and disrespect. When justice arrived, as it did most notably in the 1860s and the 1960s, it did so through the efforts of ordinary men and women whose persistent efforts on behalf of justice and whose daily rebellions against injustice made advancement along the arc possible. Understanding that the work of justice is never finished, men and women constantly renew their efforts to bend the arc 
as they address ongoing examples of discrimination and inequality. The digital exhibits in this Riches project explore and document that daily life and the extraordinary events in Florida's African American communities in order to understand the bend toward justice over time. So this is a, a brief look at what the site will look like. It is not, not open uh, for us to show it to you in its entirely yet. So what will happen is, uh, as you can see, we will have news and updates and social media. Um, we will, as we move into the actual exhibits, um, the schematic of exhibits, um, we'll go to that and that will help you see what we're doing since you can't see it um, as we intended. All right, so we will have a presentation of voting rights um, and voting suppression that will open in October. Um, Black Capital, um, which will focus on Paramore and Hannibal Square will open um, in 2021. We anticipate a project on African-American education. We have done some preliminary work on that one already. Um, black churches and religious life, civil rights movement in Florida, segregation and civil rights, and mass uh, convict leasing to mass incarceration. And that's a project we're doing um, with the Florida Prison Education Project. And that one is scheduled to open in 2023. So a number of different exhibits, they will all be available to you um, uh, all the time. So we hope people will come back periodically and see what kinds of, uh, of, um, of things are up there for them to see. So we're gonna focus today, particularly on the first project, the voting rights and the voting suppression. And then if we have time, we will say something about um, the Black Capital Project as well. All right, so voting rights and voting suppression exhibit layout uh, will look like this. There will be a section of the exhibit on OCOE. There will be a section on the expansion of the vote by constitutional amendment in the 19th and 20th centuries. There will be a section on disfranchisement and the suppression of the vote, a section on the resistance to voter suppression, and a section on coming to terms with the past. And we will also include a bibliography that bibliography is pretty extensive to the ability that we can. We will make the things that are in the bibliography available to, um, to the user. So uh, with a link to the source, um, to the uh, spreadsheet, to whatever we have, um, that takes some work because it, uh, it requires that we get, get copyright permissions to be able to do that. So again, that's probably a section that you'll want to come back to periodically to see uh, what we've been able to add to it that, that is now available to you. But we want people to be able to see the work um, that we've done. So let's look at OCOE. OCOE has received scholarly attention, most particularly in the work of Paul Ortiz, Kathleen Armstead, and Claire Strom and her students. The exhibit builds on this work, but it also adds its own interpretive elements. For the purposes of this exhibit, we talk about Okoe as about power. It was a moment of personal and familial pain as people died and hard earned property went up in flames. It was a moment which county chose to forget or ignore for most of the century that has passed since November 1920. It is very personal and local, and people remembered or forgot for personal and local reasons. It is also a frightening example of the American story of power and race. Okoe occurred at a specific moment, election day, when the exercise of the power of the ballot was contested. It was also representative of a power struggle that had its origins in the first days of the British colonial settlement in North America and in the founding of the Republic itself. It was not settled by a civil war that took the lives of more than 600,000 soldiers, 
on both sides of the conflict. The struggle was the power to define citizenship and the, the ability to live a productive life. Three arenas of the struggle were first the ballot box and the election to public office. Second, control over one's labor and equal access to economic advancement, including access to credit and protection of property. And three, equal access to social spaces that included schools, libraries, public parks, hospitals, and public spaces in which to express their views. By the end of the first decade of the 20th century, despite the ratification of three constitutional amendments that ended slavery throughout the US, defined citizenship, and granted equal rights and voting to freedmen, the South had enacted a number of laws that undermined the intent and the impact of the amendments. Disfranchising laws and state constitutional amendments complicated the process of voting and erected almost insurmountable barriers to voting by African-Americans. The effect was immediate and dramatic. The number of blacks voting in elections at all levels dropped precipitously. Historians such as Morgan Couser and Michael Perman show that in the South, power shifted into the hands of a small group of elite white men. And that gave particular power to the South because you had a small number of of men with an outsized influence um, in national politics as well. At the same time, Jim Crow laws limited access to public spaces and confined blacks to specific areas of towns and cities that did not receive modern conveniences and services, such as paved streets, water, and sewers. Public schools for black children were poorly supported, hospitals, libraries, parks, and other publicly financed facilities were lacking or were uh, poorly organized um, because of lack of funding. The economic limitations imposed on African Americans in the aftermath of the Civil War continued. Under the tenets of white supremacy, supported by the rising belief in social Darwinism, economic competition, and entrepreneurialism were actively discouraged in the Black community. Blacks did not get bank loans, they faced enormous difficulties in acquiring land, and were prevented from holding positions that had been designated for whites. Largely relegated to agricultural work, Blacks suffered the limitations to economic advancement imposed by sharecropping in the crop lean. In towns and cities, Blacks were largely limited to low wage manual labor that did not compete with white labor. For many Americans, these limitations on the political, economic, and social rights for Blacks represented the natural order of things. White Southerners saw these limitations as the restoration of a way of life that had been subverted by Reconstruction and the post-war constitutional amendments. In the second decade of the 20th century, national and international events pushed the struggle over power to the forefront again going to look at three of those events, the rise of the Second Klan, the eugenics movement, and the American entry into World War I. In 1915, the Ku Klux Klan re-emerged as a national organization. Using modern marketing techniques, the Klan appealed to the rising middle class as, if it, as it championed Protestant family values. Businessmen, political leaders, academics, and ministers joined the organization and openly advocated discrimination against Blacks, Jews, and Catholics. Klan parades occurred across the nation. County fairs routinely held Klan days where local state politicians made speeches. The Klan used violence and other forms of intimidation. They beat and lynched and burned across the American landscape particularly in the South. The eugenics movement provided a pseudo-scientific veneer for racism. It was taught in the classrooms and advocated by some of the, quote, best minds, academia. The textbook that was at the center of the 1925 Scopes trial was titled Hunter's Civic Biology and advocated a hierarchy of humanity based on physical features that placed Northern and Western Europeans at the top. The trial questioned the teaching 
Darwin's theory of evolution, it did not question the eugenics that was in the book. The American entry into World War I required the use of the draft to acquire millions of soldiers for the American army. White Southerners were alarmed by the drafting of black men into the military. In addition to the fact that it pulled labor from agriculture, they worried that returning soldiers might use their acquired military knowledge against whites. They were also concerned that blacks would see a larger world in which their status was not so confined as it was in the South. Florida had a population of almost a million in 1917 when the U.S. declared war. A total of 42,000 Floridians served, of which 40% were African American. Seven of those men were from Ocoee. Ocoee challenged the tenets of white supremacy in a number of ways. Although a number of black residents of Ocoee arrived before the Civil War as enslaved pe people, the larger number came to Ocoee after the Civil War seeking economic opportunity and finding it. Ocoee was a town of about a thousand people in 1920. Half of them um, were African American. And a third of American, African American households owned their own home and owned real property in terms of productive farmland. Mose Norman, July Perry, Valentine Hightower, and Jack Hamater were among those who migrated to Orange County and settled in Ocoee. Census data and property titles tell us that by 1900, they owned their homes and had land for citrus groves and truck farming. Family stories and census data tell us that Annie Hamater had ambitions of her own. After the birth of her three children, she attended classes at what later became Florida Memorial University and became a nurse and a midwife. And you can follow the census data, the narrative census data, and you see her listed as a housewife early on and then as a nurse or as a, a midwife. Building wealth over time meant that Ocoee's black residents began to take part in the consumerism of the age. And while most adopted the more conservative approach to the acquisition of modern consumer goods and conveniences, no doubt fearing that demonstrating their access to such goods would incite white anger. Others like Mose Norman made their hard earned wealth apparent. Norman drove a new car that must have been the envy, envy of a number of poor whites. In an important challenge to one of the pillars of white supremacy, the leaders of the black community controlled access to black labor. The men who harvested the vegetables and picked the fruit that was the backbone of the Florida economy. Nearby, white farmers and citrus growers came to July Perry to contract labor from Ocoee. Blacks in Ocoee, as in other communities across the South, built strong social institutions to provide education and support one another in the face of continual and sometimes physically violent assaults on Black life and Black bodies. Indeed, the very geography of Ocoee centered around Black churches, north and south of the town. There were two neighborhoods. One was on the north side, one was on the south side. The northern neighborhood centered around the AME church and was commonly known as the Methodist quarters. The south neighborhood centered around the Baptist church. Despite laws intended to remove Blacks from the political process, a small number always managed to vote though after the first decade of the 20th century, they did not hold any elected offices. The election of 1920 was a flashpoint that produced the massacre in Ocoee for several reasons. It was a presidential election in which there was no incumbent. Such elections are always hard fought and are often vicious. It was the first election since the end of World War I on the home front, World War I had produced a new round of hate speech that promoted 100% Americanism and fueled the question of who was a real American. During the war, the question focused on those of German heritage, 
But after the war, the question returned um, to more familiar targets. The first Red Scare deported those deemed to be radical labor organizers and communists. The multiple riots during the Red Summer of 1919 targeted Blacks. The move to ratify the 19th Amendment to enfranchise women also played a role. It was successful in August 1920 when Tennessee became the final state to ratify the amendment in time for women to vote in the November election. Although Black women, such as Florida's Eartha Falls, Mary McLeod Bethune, and Black women's organizations had fought to gain the right to vote for women, the larger suffrage movement marginalized them, and white Southern suffragists campaigned on the promise that enfranchising women would reinforce white supremacy. And that made women's vote very contentious in this upcoming election. Finally, in Florida, Black fraternal organizations made 19 year to register Blacks to vote in anticipation of legal stallets challenges to state voting laws if they were denied the ballot on election day. Whites were aware of this effort, and in the lead up to the election, the Klan paraded in numerous towns, including Daytona and Orlando, in an effort to intimidate potential Black voters. Across the state, newspapers reported acts of violence against Blacks who urged their fellow citizens to register to vote. And in Orange County, the Klan sent a threatening, threatening letter to Judge John Cheney, a Republican candidate for the Senate, who actively encouraged Black voting. On election day, there was violence across the state, but nothing compared to what happened in Ocoee. When Mose Norman arrived at the polls, he, did not, he was denied a ballot, with the polling officials claiming he had not paid his poll tax. Norman left and returned later in the day, at which time he was assaulted and fled to the home of his friend, July Perry. A group of men led by former Orlando police chief um, Salisbury pursued Perry, uh, him to Perry's home, where an altercation resulted in the wounding of Perry and Salisbury and the killing of two men in Salisbury's party. Perry was taken into custody and jailed in Orlando. In the early morning hours, he was removed from the jail and lynched. His body was riddled with bullets. Not satisfied with this action, men from surrounding towns descended on Ocoee, and when Blacks defended themselves, a gun battle ensued that could be heard as far away as Winter Garden. The northern neighborhood was set aflame. In the immediate aftermath, an NAACP investigation concluded that 30 to 50 Black citizens had died. White newspapers never changed their casualty rate from the original number in the first confrontation. The African-American community on the north side of town was destroyed by arson in homes, the church, and a Masonic lodge. Those lucky enough to escape took refuge in the woods and swamps and slowly made their way to the homes of friends and family in other communities. Blacks living on the south side of town were warned that the same could happen to them unless they left Okoli. Selling their real property for pennies on the dollar, they also fled the town. Okoli was added to the list of southern sundown towns, and no Blacks lived in Okoli until 1981. African Americans living in Orange County avoided the town at all costs, sometimes traveling miles out of their way to rather than pass through the town. And we have heard that in numerous oral histories. In Orange County, African Americans did not attempt to vote again until the 1940s. Whites in Orange County had exerted the power of white supremacy over political and economic and social life. What can we cl conclude about Ocoee? The black residents were examples of success. Within decades of the end of slavery, they had established themselves as homeowners and productive landowners. They built the institutions of community and fulfilled one of the obligations of, of citizenship in military service. 25 years earlier, Booker T. Washington had suggested that if blacks did these things, 
whites would recognize their value to, so to society and they could enjoy the franchise and perhaps social equality. Okoe put that claim to the test and paid the highest price. Okoe occurred within a climate of racial violence. Lynchings recorded by the NAACP at Tuskegee through the research done by the pioneering black sociologist uh, Monroe work and more recent work by sociologists Stuart Talney and E.M. Beck and the ongoing efforts of the Legacy Museum in Montgomery tell us about lynching in the, in the United States and particularly in the American South. From 1877 to 1950, the era of Jim Crow, some 4,700 lynchings have been recorded. Historians know that there were more than that, but that they are dependent upon the recording of lynchings in newspapers. Some lynchings, lynchings were probably never recorded in a newspaper. Newspapers were small ones and have disappeared and we have no recording of the lynchings, but we are certain there were more than 4,700. Florida was fifth with 331 lynchings, but first in the rate of lynchings because Florida had a small population and had 331 lynchings, you were more likely to be lynched in Florida than you were in Mississippi. Of the 25 counties in the South with the highest numbers of lynchings, Florida has six. And they're, I'm ranking them from top to bottom. Orange, Marion, Alachua, Polk, Columbia, and Taylor. When the NAACP released its annual lynching report for 1920, Orange County was recorded separately, not to skew the data. That is a stunning realization. Like other examples in the history of terrorism, including Wilmington, North Carolina, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and Rosewood, Florida, Okoe is especially notable for the number of dead and the physical destruction. But we should be aware that in the history of terrorism and lynching, Okoe is not a one-time thing. Okoe is part of a process that continued for year after year, decade after decade. This example of the power over the right to vote. The other sections of the exhibit focus on the national and regional context of voting rights and the suppression of the vote. So one section will look at the 13th and 14th and 15th amendments of the um, 19th century. The 19th amendment that granted woman suffrage, the 20 um, Amendment that ended the poll tax and the 26th Amendment um, that uh, expanded the right to vote to 18 year olds all in the 20th century. We'll also look at disfranchisement and suppression of the vote and we've identified um, at least seven ways in which this occurs. Um, most notably was the poll tax that was enacted in the in the 19th century. Um, literacy tests um, which required um, candidates to uh, read sections of the state constitution and interpret them. Um, whites always passed, African Americans seldom did. Gerrymandering, and gerrymandering took um, two forms. Uh, we currently uh, redraw the maps uh, very meticulously um, to obtain particular electoral outcomes, but in the past, um, they simply failed to redraw districts after the census uh, in order to empower rural counties over the rising populations in urban districts. Uh, denying the right to vote to felons. Uh, Post-Reconstruction constitutions frequently included this provision with the list of crimes that could produce disfranchisement limited to those whites believed blacks were most likely to commit. Um, in the Mississippi Constitution, murder, uh, someone who's convicted for murder does not lose the right to vote under the 
uh, post-Reconstruction uh, Constitution. Uh, but someone who is convicted of, of bigamy uh, could lose the right to vote because it was believed because um, African-American marriages um, during slavery were not legal marriages. And if they remarried uh, after slavery, then they could be accused of bigamy. Uh, white, uh, white primary. The white primary was, uh, the primary was introduced in the early 20th century, initially designed to overcome the power of entrenched political elites and increase the likelihood of more competitive races for the nomination to office. But in the South, Democrats linked voting in the primary to party membership, and party membership was denied um, to African Americans. So in effect, the primary election in the South was the election of a person because, um, because Democrats were so securely in power. Fraud and contested elections. And in, in Florida, we're very familiar with that. So um, two of the biggest contested elections, of course, was the election of uh, 1876 and the 2000 election. But fraud was a part of elections too, and indeed, uh, when, when white Southerners began to enact uh, disfranchisement laws, um, they claimed that they were forced to do this um, because of, of black voting. Because in order to overcome black voting, they were forced um, to stuff the ballot boxes. And if they eliminated black voting, then they could be honest men again, a rather convoluted way of thinking. And also, more currently, restricting the opportunity to cast a ballot. Um, so increasingly, we see polling places closed and other efforts um, to, res to restrict the casting of the ballot. There was resistance always to voter suppression. Uh, Okoe is an example uh, of that resistance. Um, Anti-poll tax efforts across the South. Um, those, that led to the 24th Amendment uh, to prohibit the collection of the poll tax in federal elections, and the 1966 Supreme Court decision in Harper v. Virginia Board of Education uh, elections um, to uh, eliminate the poll tax um, in state elections. Florida had rescinded its poll tax requirement in the state elections in 1937. The anti-poll tax efforts are interestingly enough linked to women's suffrage as well. As Sarah Wilkerson uh, Freeman has shown, once the poll tax applied to women in the South, as it did after the election of 1920, the number of women voting did not meet expectations. In poor families, even men frequently did not pay the poll tax and vote. So women uh, often didn't vote as well. If women were to vote, the poll tax had to go, and women joined in the fight um, to end the poll tax in order to be able to vote. There were voter registration drives. Um, we saw one in 1920, most notably voter registration drives occurred um, in the rights era. An expansion of the vote to 18-year-olds, um, um, the Florida Constitutional Amendment to restore felon voting rights um, is the most recent example. Coming to terms with the past will be a part of this exhibit that will continue to have um, have work done. Um, there have been efforts since um, the 1990s um, to understand Okoe and to, um, to have people remember this episode in our past. Um, July Perry received um, a gravestone um, as a result of these efforts. In 2018, the city of Okoe um, enacted a resolution um, to recognize the, their role in this, in this event. Um, soil was collected from, rich, from lynching sites, um, especially the site uh, where um, July Perry was um, lynched and sent to the Montgomery Legacy Museum. There was a July Perry um, marker, historic marker, that was unveiled at the Orange County Regional History Center, and this was placed in uh, 2019 in collaboration with the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery. The Valencia College um, vote, hashtag votes for all um, to encourage community uh, conversations about race and voting. 
and the Orange County Regional History Center exhibit that will open uh, also in October of this year. This will end up being a part of an ongoing conversation because you can see how it will quite readily uh, fit into our current um, discussions on, on Black Lives Matter. And the state has recently enacted a law to, um, to require the teaching of OCOE in Florida public schools. And this will also engender ongoing conversations about how to teach this and what to teach. And then the issue of reparations have come up. Florida get, uh, provided reparations uh, for Rosewood back in the, in the 1990s. And in this past legislative session, that was, that was brought up for the uh, descendants of Okoe. So this is an ongoing conversation. Um, even though it's, it's set in some ways, it's an ongoing conversation that we look forward to having. Let's take just a moment to think about black capitalism. This, this um, exhibit will be different. It too is ongoing. So um, for the past three years, students in my economic history class and at, at Rollins College have been working on mapping um, economic development in Paramore and in Hannibal Square. Uh, the Paramore project included the identification of black businesses. By the way, the map in the background here is a Sanborn map of Paramore in 1956. Um, so they've, they've identified black businesses, mapped black businesses. Um, this year's class will digitize images and collect oral histories on, on Paramore. The Hannibal Square project uh, is one in which they mapped black home ownership and black in two decades. Um, they, we will be digitizing images and we have been collecting oral histories for that one as well. When we finish with those two communities, we plan to go on and do the same thing in other black communities in Central Florida so that we begin to have a sense of the, of the entrepreneurship um, in black communities in the age of Jim Crow. So what does this mean? What, is the ben what are the benefits of the project? Students, I think, are engaged in community history. And I think this is important. Um, we assign books about Black history and they read them and they write essays on them. But I think it's important for students to engage in, the com in Black communities, to confront history directly. I think they, they learn a lot from that and, and it's important. Making Central Florida's African-American past accessible to a broad audience of academic and public users at no cost is a part of this as well. I hear over and over in news uh, um, interviews that people say they just don't have access to African-American history. There's a lot there. There's a lot that has been written, but, um, but we want to make it easy for them to find it and at no cost. It allows people to engage in the sources, um, to understand how the, the exhibit was developed. And these exhibits, as I've said many times, are not one and done. And it, it's a digital project housed in a long-term project that can add materials and ask new questions as we go along. And so I look forward to having you visit the site as soon as it's open and to entertaining your questions about what we're doing and how we're doing it. Thank you. Connie, I have a, a question for you, which I'm gonna post right now. Okay. Um, hang on just a second. It's over in the group chat, but I'll also read it to you. Okay. Um, so you don't have to switch back and forth between your screens. One of the questions I have here is what is the impact on and what is the impact of your riches information and materials that are related to voter suppression and about the OCOE teaching mandate in the state? Okay, so uh, I think I am so excited that this is a mandate, um, that people will learn about OCOE, that students will learn about OCOE, that they will ask questions about OCOE. What I don't want to happen, what I hope will not happen, is that it is seen as this one moment in time and not part of the larger 
in the 20s and in, in Florida that seen as somehow unique and not representative of the whole. And so I'm hoping that this site will help people see that this went on um, in so many places at so many times. Um, and even when physical violence wasn't a part of what was happening, there was racism acted in ways that prevented uh, people from, recogn from, from recognizing their full potential. Um, and I hope that this site will help people to see how insidious this was and how destructive it was um, and to ask questions about it. Anybody else have any questions right at the moment? Remember, you can type them in the chat screen over on the, what you do if you have, if your screen is fairly small, there's a, you'll either see the function for chat or you can hit the three dots that say more. And I'll look here for a second because there's another one that I have that has come to me outside of this, uh, outside the chat screen that I can put in, but I don't want to hog up all the time. Okay, well, I'll get ready to type that one um, so that everybody can see it as well and it can be part of the record of your seminar. Um, it looks as though your project on the, on, on the issues about OCOE in the past and uh, for quite some time, as well as the, uh, the project generally that you have that relates to racism and voter suppression, um, have a, an academic community aspect to them. Um, and so what we're wondering about is how people might be able to, to become involved in what you are presenting through Riches on the OCOE issue and experience. And I'll type that too while you answer. Okay. So I can tell you how some people have become involved already. Um, just in the past month, I have had phone calls uh, from one from a descendant of the Hamater family, actually. And we have talked several times and chatted back and forth through email uh, about her family's experience um, and listening to her stories and what the, and the stories that were down um, and how the family coped with what happened. The Hamaters, by the way, um, sold their, uh, their land. Uh, they moved to Sanford and, and lived in, Sanitor, in, in, in uh, Sanford. Uh, Jack Hameter uh, died in the 1940s. Um, and um, and his, his descendants um, lived in Sanford. Um, they've lived in other parts of, uh, of Florida. And they have rich stories to tell. Um, We've also had uh, done oral histories with people um, who talk about that they remember their grandfathers or great grandfathers um, who experienced this and how nothing was ever the same for them. Um, that they lost their investments, they witnessed a horrific uh, episode of violence that they were often angry for reasons that, that they as children didn't understand. Um, and so you hear these stories of what happened and you, and you listen to these families um, talk about the pain that was associated with this event. Um, I've had other people call me uh, and, and provide me with, with little bits of evidence. I got, a, I got the um, uh, membership role uh, from the Masonic Lodge that has, um, uh, has July Perry's name on it. Um, those kinds of things. So um, you may know, you may have some piece of information that you can share with me that helps to put back together the pieces of this story because so much was lost. Um, so much of what we know, we know from white newspapers who quite frankly are giving you a very prejudiced story. Um, the Sanford Herald, just a couple of days after it happened, says, well, 
we've got everything back to order and we should just forget about this. You know, I mean, that's not the exact quote, but that's essentially what they said, you know, just forget about it. Um, and, um, and so we have a hard time putting together there um, to uh, have images. There were no images <laughs> that we don't, so we don't have images of the event. Um, we have to depend on, on people sharing with us um, the things they know about the event. So um, that's one way to get involved. Uh, pay attention to what we're doing, all right? If we get something wrong, and I say, we do this in riches all the time. Um, we uh, have this piece of information, it turns out it's not correct. Well, that's one of the wonderful things about working digitally. You can go back in and fix it. Um, and we fix things all the time. So if you see something we're doing, uh, some piece of information, do you don't think that's quite right? Let's discuss it. Let's see what we can find out about it. So um, correspond with us, engage with us. We're happy to have your input. Okay. I have two more questions for you. One from Bruce Jans. He has came in at 151, uh, right about the time we put the other one in. Um, he's wondering how recent are the events you are researching in the projects under this general, more, more general project? He says, it seems to me that we're absolute, that we absolutely need to hear about the lynchings during Reconstruction, but Blacks, Black Lives Matter is interested in killings happening right now. Is there any history project on these killings as well? If not, is there a way of seeing a connecting thread between the in inequality and in these historical events and what's happening now? Okay, yes, there is a lot of research on, on lynchings big, uh, from Reconstruction forward. So, um, so collecting that information has been, uh, has been part of the historical process as well. Um, most of the, uh, of the work, particularly on, on lynchings, and, and one of the difficulties um, during, during Reconstruction itself was um, how well that was documented, how, how many of those were documented. But, uh, but yes, certainly we can, in talking about violence against African Americans, we can go all the way back, you know, to the, uh, to the beginning of the Republic and to the colonial era to, to, to document that. For this particular project, we chose to, um, to make the time frame between uh, between um, the end of Reconstruction um, and the present. Okay, I have two more that have just come in um, from Bill Fernandez. Isn't it unfair to require the current population to pay reparations to descendants of Okoe residents? Well, we've already done that <laughs> once, not to Okoe, uh, but in the case of Rosewood. Um, so in the 1990s, um, there was a commission that investigated Rosewood and the effects of Rosewood. Um, and, um, and in fact, in the Florida Historical Quarterly, there's a, there are several articles in there uh, about that commission and about what they learned um, as they investigated this and the long-term effects um, and uh, we have paid reparations to any number of, of groups. We paid uh, reparations to the, uh, to the Japanese Americans who were interred. Uh, we've paid uh, other examples of reparations as well. Um, and so, you know, um, whether it, it, it is, not, um, I think it is the, it, it is something we have to consider in order to understand and to come to grips with what has happened in our past. All right, and there's one more, and we have just about enough time to answer this one. How can we better reference the party affiliation with one phrase or brief um, with an explanation of African Americans in political history so that the audience better understands the confusion over how African Americans were Republicans and later Democrats. Um, yes, and uh, and that transition came um, in the in the middle of the twentieth century. Um, certainly, with um, with the New Deal, although um, African Americans were not particularly targeted for. Um, for um, economic um, help, um, the, the institutional um, processes that were put into place um, 
came to benefit them as well. And, um, and so they began looking at, um, at the Democratic Party more closely. Um, in the civil rights, um, they also, uh, you, you saw the switch place. Um, it, the, the switch takes place not instantaneously, but over the course of time. Um, but it's an accumulation of events, uh, an accumulation of pieces of legislation um, that convince people to switch parties. Um, interestingly enough, um, white Southerners move toward the Republican Party at the same time. So it is a, it, it is a flip-flop between the parties that takes place um, over the course of time. We had a couple of questions left over from after the session ended um, today, and I want to address those questions so that we can add it to the, um, to the version that we post online. Um, the first question that we had was from C.J. Williams, and he asked, is there any discovery regarding how these systemic massacres spread, how this type of repression was moved from one state to another, from one community to another, almost like a playbook. They are, there are a lot of similarities between events that take place uh, across the country, uh, but I don't think it's exactly a playbook. I think there are a number of ways in which they end up being very similar um, without actually consulting one another. So one of the things we have to keep in mind is that there are there was racism throughout the United States, um, as we've shown, the rise in hate speech, the, uh, the number of ways in which um, this became, uh, or always was, but even increased uh, across the United States. And uh, in thinking about that, there are a couple of organizations that facilitate that, one being the rise of the Klan, so the Klan is, uh, in its Reconstruction era was confined to the, the ex-Confederate states. As you encounter it in 1915 and moving forward, it is a national phenomenon. It is, a, it is there in the South, but it is across the United States. The governor of Oregon was a Klan member. Um, the state of Colorado had an enormous uh, amount of difficulty with, uh, with the Klan. And, and so it was everywhere. And that meant you had an organization, a racist organization that was across the United States. And, and so in many ways, the, the events could come out looking the same. And I think, uh, I think that's part of it. But I think another thing that we didn't talk about earlier is that you have so much more communication. You have communication in a number of different ways that is much faster and, and enters into the fabric of the, of the nation uh, in a way that wasn't possible before. Um, first of all, you have, um, you have the rise of movies. And one of the movies that helped to inspire the founding of the Second Klan was Birth of a Nation. Everybody saw that. Um, it, millions of people saw that. The President of the United States saw it and talked about how wonderful it was. Uh, so you have movies, uh, you have uh, nationally distributed newspapers. Um, so big city newspapers traveled far outside their own region and you have essentially a national press in such newspapers as the New York Times and the, uh, the Chicago Tribune. Uh, newspapers from San Francisco and Los Angeles uh, were distributed widely. Um, uh, reporting services allowed stories to, to go out to be reported across the nation. Um, the Okoe event uh, was reported widely. Uh, now, they were often very small articles, but they're there. Um, we've been uh, collecting those articles to see what people said, and largely they said what had been reported in Florida. Uh, they didn't send reporters to investigate, but, but the event was known. The event was known about across the, the country. Um, and then you have the radio. By 1920, you have the radio. And, and you have 
um, you have the ability um, to broadcast and, and broadcast all kinds of things. I referenced the Scopes trial um, earlier. The Scopes trial was broadcast by the Chicago radio stations. Uh, so you have the ability um, to broadcast things. In, 19, in the 1930s, when Claude Neal was lynched in the panhandle of Florida, uh, he, was in, he was in jail. And the lynching was known about for days before it happened. Um, because it was broadcast on the radio, that they were going to take care of this on X day at X time. And people came from Alabama, they came from Georgia, they came from, uh, from uh, Florida, um, hundreds of them to witness the lynching of Claude Neal. So you had these, the, these large scale events. And if, if anything is different here, it's the size of the events. Um, the events become enormous in size, uh, so much so that some historians have referred to it as a festival of violence. Um, and so they became bigger. Um, there was, they arson became more of, a, of, of a, an event in, in and of itself. So you saw sections of towns and whole towns that are, um, that are burned down in, in these events. So the scale becomes bigger and the knowledge of it becomes broader. And once that happens, you know, it, it isn't a matter of a playbook. It's a matter of uh, being, of having knowledge of what happened in other places. Um, that, was a, that was a good question. Um, the other question that we didn't have time for came from Alexandra Lopez. And she asked, does the, does the Rich's project touch on the lynching of Italian Americans in Florida as well. We have not included that, but that was a serious matter. And it was a, it was a serious matter, not just for Italians, but for Bahamians, for others who were not citizens of the United States, but ended up um, in, encountering this violence and, and, um, and being lynched. Um, the Florida Historical Quarterly has at least two articles in it um, that touch on the lynching of, of Italian Americans. One of those articles um, is a study by an Italian scholar who looked at the way the Italian newspapers covered the lynchings. And that's important to understand because when Italians were lynched, or when Bahamians were lynched, um, you had protests from the Italian government and from the British government about what happened. And it happened not just in Florida, it happened uh, across the South as well. Um, but uh, it makes the lynching no less tragic, but those governments did protest the, um, and with formal protests um, to the American government about um, the lynching of, of their citizens. Um, and you need to understand that there's another factor in that that's not readily apparent. Um, and that is in the early part of the 20th century, Italians fell under the, the um, Jim Crow laws um, just like African Americans did um, because um, um, the, they were classified as, as people of color. And, uh, and so they had to abide by the Jim Crow laws, it, just as African Americans did. Um, there's a whole body of literature on the making of whiteness, on the ways in which uh, people, be, uh, entire groups of citizens are over time uh, come to be recognized or come to be included among the group that was uh, considered white. So white was not not as easily defined in the early part of the 20th century as you might suppose. Um, and various groups of people, including um, Irish, were not considered white uh, for a considerable period of time. Uh, so the making of whiteness is, is all a part of understanding that uh, the reason why Italian Americans could end up being lynched too. These are both very good questions. I'm sorry we didn't have, uh, we ran out of time before we addressed them earlier, uh, but they will be in the larger uh, archived presentation. Thank you so much.